Well, what is the best 30 caliber bullet for the 300 Magnums for elk hunting? We hope to find out on this episode of Ron Spomer Outdoors Podcast. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another podcast. You know, we are getting some pretty good questions and some pretty good answers from all of you folks, and we really appreciate it. We heard just recently from Bill, who wrote in at Ron Spomer Outdoors, our website, about his, uh, I guess it's an approaching love affair with the 400 Legend. He seems pretty excited about this. Let me read what he had to say about this new cartridge. Savage has 12 different models in 400 Legend. They do? (laughs) <laughs> this is a, a big surprise to me, but I really haven't looked. But this is what Bill says. They've got 12 different rifle models in 400 Legend. Well, in the works. They're not out yet. Okay. I'm sure Ruger will have their American series chambered in the round. Now, I am a huge 3030 fan, but the 400 offers superior frontal area. I read where a young lady took a huge pronghorn deer at 280 yards. Now, I'm not sure if, if Bill means that this deer was a fork horn or if he's referring to the pronghorn antelope. Um, I would imagine that, but uh, just in case any of you are wondering, the deer family and the antelope family are two different things. And really, the pronghorn antelope in the United States of America isn't even an antelope. It belongs to this, well, taxonomically, it's a family called Antelocapridae. It is the only surviving member or species in that entire family group. So it's not really a true antelope like they have over in Africa. And it's certainly not deer because it has horns, but they come off. All horned animals, cattle, bison, uh, sheep, bighorn sheep, and that type, those horns are permanent. They grow and they grow and they grow throughout the animal's life. They're not shed like antlers on a deer. A deer is a deer because it sheds its antlers. So moose, caribou, all the animals that have antlers and shed them annually and grow new ones, those are in the deer family. So this Antelocapridae family, they grow a horn and then they shed the outer sheath of the horn while they retain an inner core. And then a new horn begins to grow up from the hair at the base of that. The hair gets modified into horn. They're both made out of keratin. So instead of being a fluffy, hairy sort of a thing, it turns into a hard bony sort of a thing, but it's not really a bone. (laughs) It's pretty interesting stuff. So it's no wonder people get confused about all this, but it's fascinating things that as a hunter, you just get interested in. You start to do your research and figure it all out. At any rate, a 280 yard shot at a deer or a pronghorn is a Pretty nice little shot. And with a 400 Legend rifle, that's pretty amazing too, because it's not exactly designed for long reach. I would consider it a 200 yard rifle or cartridge. At any rate, let's continue with Bill's uh, letter here. He says, at 45,000 PSI, it's considerably more pressing than the 3030, meaning it has more chamber pressure than the 3030 Winchester. I look at the 400 Legend more like a 375 Winchester operating at a higher pressure. Another advantage with the 400 Legend is that it's going to be chambered in bold action rifles and carbines and ARs, which is a much less expensive option than a lever gun. Lever guns now run $850 to $1,200. An accurate bolt gun runs around $375 to $500, and an upper for an AR rifle is $300 to $400. Also, with the 400 Legend, use uh, use of a 240 to 250 grain hard cast bullet. It has a wide flat nose, which would make for a great feral hog and a black bear slapper, he calls them. <laughs> the 400 Legend offers a lot for hunters like myself. It doesn't have an overall length restriction. Oh, I think he means in in states that have these uh, overall length cartridge restrictions, you can't have a too long of a cartridge because it certainly has an overall length cartridge uh, restriction for the rifles that it's chambered for. Um, in the woods, a lightweight 16-inch barreled carbine with a large diameter bullet seems like a great idea to anchor your game 
uh, and have a 250 to 300 yard capability if pressed. So I'm looking at possibly a Ruger Ranch Carbine or a Savage Axis 2, light and short with good glass. All right. So Bill is definitely excited about the 400 Legend. I had a chance to hunt with it last year before it really came out, sort of a prototype. And I was pretty impressed with it for a straight walled cartridge. I think it's a pretty nice option. I've done a video um, on it. You might want to look for that. And we're going to do something with uh, some of the hunting that I did with it. A friend of mine took a heck of a beautiful whitetail with it. And uh, we'll do a little bit of a video on that here pretty soon. So thanks for writing in, Bill. We really appreciate that. I'm glad to see you're excited. I always enjoy it when anyone is excited about a new cartridge or a new rifle. It just brings back memories of when I was a younger man and I got excited about new potentials like that. All right. Now, this is from one of our patrons. Um, if you would like to join us on Patreon, we would sure appreciate it. We always appreciate the support we get from our patrons, like this gentleman. His name is Bird. And he says, hey, Ron, you talk about shooting hogs on the move a few episodes back. I have a better recommendation than a tire with some cardboard in the middle. I had said a good way to practice on a running target is to have a on a slight slope, fill an old tire with a uh, disc of cardboard and roll that, have someone roll it from behind a safe structure or something. And when it gets out in front of you, you can shoot a moving target. And it's an old game we used to play. You can also do it with big balls of some kind. But he says he's got a better idea. Let's see what it is. What I do is I set my clay target thrower up for rabbits and I use my 17 WSM. So everything is moving about the same speed as the hog and the center fire round that I use in the field. This way I can shoot from different distances and angles and directions and not wear out my shoulder. An added bonus is the clay is about the size of the brain I'm aiming for. Woo. <laughs> that is tough stuff, man. If you can shoot little clay discs rolling along the ground with a 17 WSM or any other rifle, you are going to be a darn good running game shot on feral logs or anything else. So, <laughs> yeah, you might want to try that. All right. This gentleman is interested in straight walled cartridges, muzzle loaders, and slug gun rounds. Let's see what he's got to say here. I can calculate um, that, what is he saying? Oh, he, I've already responded to him. This is a response back. He says, I appreciate your response. I can calculate what you told me, but I thought a bit of interest for deer hunters would be to compare and contrast straight wall cartridges, muzzle loaders, and slug gun rounds. We often talk about one or the other, but rarely compare them against the others. So I thought it might make for a great episode. Thanks for your extremely insightful shows. It really goes to show your level of understanding in external and internal ballistics, and it makes useful for real-world hunters. Well, I appreciate that. I don't even have a name for this gentleman. Oh, here it is on the other page, Jim. And Jim is another patron. Jim, we really appreciate that. And that is a good suggestion. I wrote back to Jim right away, and I said, hey, that is a good idea. You know, we'll, re we'll compare the 3030 and the 400 or the 350 or the 308 and the 30 out 6 but we never really seem to jump from the rifle cartridges into the shotgun slugs or muzzle loaders. So that is a good idea. It would be nice to know exactly what uh, various cartridges do in comparison to some of the older things or the uh, different options. I'm going to do that. I will put that on the agenda. We'll compare, say, a 12-gauge slug to a 45 or 54 caliber muzzle loader and some straight wall cartridge because those are some of the comparisons one needs to make in some of these states where they have restrictions on what uh, cartridges and rifles you can shoot. So great idea, Jim. We appreciate that. And here is one from Eric on plastic tip bullets. So, oh, this, yes, yes, yes. Eric is another patron who contacted me and said, in response to a previous video, I did mentioning the plastic tip bullets, or maybe it was just a, a Facebook post that I did on it. But I mentioned that Ballistic Tips by Nosler in the late 90s, I believe, were the first ones. Maybe that was in the early 2000s, getting kind of getting kind of fuzzy there in the background. Um, but at, and when those came out, it was like, what's this, a plastic tip bullet? So that was my first memory of plastic tip bullets. But several people wrote in to say, no, the plastic tip bullets really came out in Canada quite a while back uh, from the Dominion cartridge manufacturers. And I remember Dominion with 22 long rifles when I was a kid hunting jackrabbits. They were sort of the least expensive. They were probably five to 10 cents less a box than the Winchesters and the Remingtons and Federals. So I would often pick those up. And then Eric here not only 
agreed with that and said CIL was one of the company names that made this Dominion ammunition. He said they were making this these bullets and he called them the saber tip. And they were already out in the mid-1960s. And he sent me photographs of them. I'll have my team here. Silas, can you put up some pictures for the people who are watching this on YouTube? Uh, they can see this. And you'll see by the box, Old Dominion's uh, <laughs> yellowish box that was popular back in the 1960s. It's pretty obviously an old, old box of ammo. And then the bullets in the box of this photo that um, Eric sent would obviously, they look fairly old too. And you can clearly see they've got some kind of a plastic or polymer or Delrin tip on them. And uh, so that's kind of cool to see that, wow, way back in the 60s, someone was doing this and it apparently never really caught on. And then Nasr must have known about it and remembered it from the old days and they decided to revive it. Uh, and then another response I need to make for a lot of folks who wrote in on this photograph that I put on my Facebook page, Ron Spomer Outdoors Facebook, I had fired some, I'm pretty sure they were federal plastic tip bullets in a 308. And the, and the bullet at the bottom of the magazine that was getting battered around with the recoil from shooting shot after shot, I generally shoot the first round and maybe the second one, and then you top off and you shoot some more. And when I pulled it out, I was really shocked to see that the tip had gotten kind of people accused me of putting a belt grinder sander on it or something to shave it down. But it was damaged a little bit and kind of fuzzed out weirdly. And I just thought that was a little bit unusual. And I had seen other plastic tip bullets get a little bit of damage to them, though dent a little bit. So they're not perfect in my experience for holding a perfect sharp tip. They can get damaged. And the reason I say this is because the reason they were brought out was back in the old days when we had lead exposed tip spire point bullets, that lead would easily get damaged. Pushing them into the magazine or in and out of the chamber, they would sometimes drag and get shaved off a little bit. But the worst problem was the battering in the magazine. They sort of float in that metal box magazine. So under recoil, they're slamming back and forth. And that can damage the tip tips. It blunts them. And the longer you leave them in there, the more shots you fire, <laughs> the more of a flat nose bullet you end up with, which is not something you're too pleased to have. So that's why they came up with these hard tips. Now, other ways that bullets are made with harder tips to retain their shape is by having what Remington called the bronze point, which is kind of a bronze cap over the lead exposed tip. So the lead's no longer exposed. Winchester did a similar one with the silver tip. And I believe initially they actually used silver. When that got kind of expensive, they went to aluminum, which wasn't quite as effective as preventing the battering, but it was pretty good. So now the, all the rage, of course, are the, uh, the polymer tips. And there are different kinds of polymer. Polymer means it's a polyester, something or other, plastic of some kind. But some are harder and more durable than others in various ways. So I would imagine the different companies that make these different tips try different recipes to come up with some that don't dent as easily as others and some of them fray a little more easily or maybe crack. I mean, I heard from folks who said they've seen everything from intact plastic tips on the far side of the game animal that they'd shot, meaning it's, or suggesting at least, that it's really durable. But then there's others saying that they find pieces or they find them at the bottom of their ammo box because they've broken off or they've pulled out, all sorts of things. Uh, and it, they're just sort of in common with what you would expect over the years with millions of rounds of ammunition, something is going to happen to those bullets. Uh, and you, you just see it all over time, but just something to be aware of. I'm not running down anyone's polymer tip bullets. I use a lot of them and have had great success with them. It's just, it's interesting to note how long they've been around it, that there are different types and they can work very well, and sometimes they can kind of fail. But, you know, don't get too freaked out if that plastic tip is a little bit damaged. It does not do a heck of a lot to mess up your ballistic performance until you're quite a ways down range. Many tests have been made shooting for accuracy with damaged tips, and at 100 to 200 yards, you really don't notice much of a difference at all. Uh, now, if you were target shooting beyond 300 yards and wanted to really be precise, then it's going to start to have an effect. And it will increase drag a little bit too. So it all adds up. All right. Um, now here's the question about that 300 bullet, the bullet for a 300 Magnum. Ron, I happily watch your programs. Lots of good information. Thank you, sir. Uh, 
But you often say that it's about choosing the right bullet. And there, you lose me. Hmm. Specifically, I load 300 Win Mag and 300 PRC, and I'm looking forward to elk hunting in South Dakota. Ooh, that sounds like fun. Did my first elk hunt in South Dakota with my brother. I didn't have a tag. I just tagged along. <laughs> he had a tag and a shot. His first elk, our first elk, it was a big deal. Coming up on your first elk after you've shot only pronghorns and whitetails and mule deer, whew, that's a big change, man. That is the big animal. So back to uh, this gentleman. I, gosh, I don't have his. Oh, here it is, Dave. Dave from Minnesota. Thanks for writing, Dave. Dave says, uh, the loads that people are talking about these days, about mm, they're taking 500-yard-plus shots. I expect to be shooting 100 to 300 yards. So I have a burger, 190 grain VLD. The box says it's a hunting end match, question mark. 165 grain Nosler Acubond and a Hornady 212 grain hunting bullet available to load with at least three powder choices. So what I suggest is that when you say, meaning me, use the right bullet, you maybe mention two or three kinds of bullets for reference. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's a good idea. I realize you have to be careful, but surely uh, you can <laughs> you can mention something without getting in trouble is essentially what he's saying here. So thanks for your great work. All right, Dave. I <laughs> Mia culpa here. Yes, I can mention best bullets. But Dave, what I'm really saying when I frequently will pop up with, just be sure you use the right bullet. I'm assuming that folks have a basic understanding of what is the right bullet for the right application. In other words, they're not going to use a frangible varmint bullet to try to take uh, Cape Buffalo. And they're not going to use a solid to try to take out uh, a pronghorn or a rabbit. <laughs> you know, we've got a general idea of what the right bullet is. But at the same time, I take what you're driving at here is you, we've got so many bullets that are close to the same. A lot of bonded bullets. Is one better than another? Is the Sirocco or the Acubond or the Interbond or all these different bonded bullets, are they just the same or is one better than the other? Uh, what about the partition styles, the hard, harder lead core bullets or the all copper bullets with no lead? And then is it retaining its pedals or shedding its pedals? And all these variations. But then again, that's why it's rather difficult for me to say which one is the right bullet, because depending on the range at which that bullet is expected to land and the velocity at which you launch it and all these sorts of different factors, I really can't decide for you what the best bullet is. You're going to have to, all of you folks, and, and I include you, we're going to have to study the bullets and just get a a feel for their reputation, listen to others, and always take what other folks tell you with a grain or two of salt, because quite often it's just human nature to have what we consider a failure of some kind and blame it on something. The rifle's no good, the cartridge is no good, or the bullet. I think you're right to blame the bullet in most cases, unless you don't take into account the shooter's precision for shot placement um, or the range at which that bullet landed. But you do need to consider all of those things. And then remember, if someone is just complaining bitterly because they shot and lost an animal because of bullet failure, I don't know if you can absolutely take that uh, for what really happened. Because if he didn't recover the animal, does he really know that he put the bullet in the right place? How does he know that bullet performed or didn't perform? So don't just take a one-off answer for the absolute. Study it, get an idea of the reputation. For instance, many, many people will tell me that Nosler's Acubond bullet is probably one of the best of the bonded bullets for terminal performance. Exactly why, I can't tell you, but they just have played around with a lot of different options and they really like that one. At the same time, there are a lot of folks who absolutely swear by burger hunting bullets, which are not bonded. And you go down the list and everyone has a favorite that someone else thinks is just worthless. So it's hard to say this is absolutely the right one. And that's why I don't say when I say use the right bullet, I don't give you the exact name of that bullet. So once again, I'm, I apologize if you were hoping that I would say definitely use bullet X in size such and such and all the rest of it. It just can't be done that easily. So good question, though, and it, it's something that we all need to think about. So, all right, those are our patrons. And now we're going to go to folks who have 
written in in, I believe, yeah, here we go. This is a question on bullets. Uh, wow. This is from Michael, and he says he's on assignment in China. That must be interesting. All right, Michael. Hey, Ron, I've been a loyal supporter for many years, and I love your YouTube channel. Thank you so much, Michael. I really appreciate it. I was watching your episode on wind deflection, and I had a question that many others might also be wondering about. What or when rebarreling or making a custom rifle, what effect can we expect on stabilizing the bullet with a faster twist rate than the factory's twist rates? In addition, does a faster twist rate lead to more or less wind deflection? Thanks. Um, I always get back to Pennsylvania for whitetail hunting, and I'm rebarreling a 270 Winchester and a 35 Whalen. Okay, those are good questions, Michael. Now let me just go back again, stabilizing the bullet, faster twist. All right. The reason you want to consider a faster twist barrel in whatever you're shooting is if you want to be shooting the longer high BC bullets that are out today. So, for example, in your 270, the longest bullets that we could stabilize in factory twist rates, one in 10, it's been the standard for a long time, is about a 150 grain bullet spire point. Sometimes you can get away with a boat tail spire point. But you start to get to these long secant ogives with a really sharp tip on it, like I'm holding up right now, if you folks can see it. Uh, if you're just listening to a podcast, obviously you can't, but you'll, you'll get the general idea. Those long needle-nosed bullets, they get too long to stabilize. Remember, I, I'm saying this all the time, and I'm sorry to repeat myself, but there are always newcomers who don't know this stuff. The bullet's length is what is going to require the faster twist rate. Short, stubby bullets, you can stabilize those with a fairly slow rate of twist in your barrel. But they get long and then they start wobbling. And that's where you need to speed up their twist, just like a top. You've got to get gyroscopic stability in that bullet. So the twist rate, that's why you want to increase it. With a 270 shooting the new 160 to 175 grain bullets, you're going to need a one and eight to one and seven and a half inch twist rate to stabilize those. Um, the 35 Whalen's not really much of a problem. You don't get a lot of high, long, high BC bullets in 35 calibers, usually topping out at a 250 grain. Uh, and the standard twist rates will stabilize that. But some folks will shoot some custom bullets as heavy as 300 grains in the 35, for which you might need to look at a faster twist. So that's why you would do it. Now, as far as the wind deflection on a bullet, twist rate has nothing to do with that other than if you don't have your bullet perfectly stabilized, you will increase its drag because it'll be doing a little bit of this sort of a twisty motion with the nose of the bullet circling around itself. Nutation, nodding, uh, what else do they call it? Well, I'm forgetting the other word, but there are various things that a bullet does before it settles down, as we always say, and gets a nice smooth flight. So think of a top going not quite fast enough and it wobbles a little bit on its axis and doesn't spin perfectly vertically on its axis. That's what bullets can do um, when they're a little bit on the edge of being unstable. And that increases the surface area that's hitting the wind as a bullet's moving down range. That increases or decreases its ballistics efficiency, which is just aerodynamic efficiency. So you've got more drag on the bullet. That slows it down, means it's in the air for a longer period of time, and the wind deflection increases on it. So the twist rate really does not otherwise. If you've got a perfectly stabilized bullet, the twist rate's not going to change the, the effect of the wind deflection on that bullet. So um, I think that answers your question there, Michael. I hope so. Let me know if I didn't get it clear. Steve, uh, Steve N. from Minnesota has questions about cartridges. Thank you for all the information each week. Uh, is it bad to use the Nosler Acubond long-range bullet in a 6.8 Western with 165 grain bullet on game within 400 yards, elk and whitetails? No, I wouldn't say it's wrong at all. I think that's a great bullet for that. Um, I, I know that it has a thinner outer layer on the bullet and does not retain as much weight upon impact. I'm not sure what you mean by a thinner outer layer there, Stephen, because to my knowledge, it does not. The, the outer layer, of course, is the jacket. That's the metallic jacket. It would be a gilding metal jacket on the Acubond. Some uh, bullet jackets are pure copper. Some have 5% um, zinc in them, I think. Um, or is it? Yeah, would have been 
zinc at 5% or 10%. Those are called gilding metal. It makes them a little harder, but a little more brittle as well. Uh, so that's what you're talking about with the jacket. And thin jacketed bullets would be for varmints where you want the bullet to come apart easily. Uh, sometimes you'll get a, a game bullet that is thinner up at the nose and then it gets thicker as it goes back to help control expansion. It opens quickly and easily, but then it starts to get tougher as you go back and that stops the expansion. But I do, I just to my knowledge, I don't think the Acubon bullet has a thinner outer jacket than their typical bullets. But and maybe I'm wrong, but it's from my memory, I don't think that's an issue. At any rate, he goes on, with limited ammunition in my area, the choices are not great. So finding a high weight, high BC bullet in 277 caliber is hard. Barnes only has 130 grains av available in the TTSX. Then question number two, uh, let's just finish this one off first. Stephen, the uh, 130 grain in the TTSX stops there in the 270 because primarily 270 Winchester, the old one, been around since 1925, one in 10 twist. Those copper bullets get to be really long if you push the weight up. So 130 grain TTSX bullet, all copper, is probably as long as or a little bit longer than a 150 grain bullet with a lead core. That's why they can't go any heavier. I mean, they can. And the rumor is that they are working on one now that is going to be a 155 grain bullet in 0.277. And that is designed for the new 6.8 with the 27 nozzler or the new 27s that have the faster twist barrels. And of course, if you, going back to the previous um, questioner here, if you had a special twist barrel put on and uh, made it fast twist, then you could load those bullets. And it'll be interesting to see if ammunition companies start loading the heavier bullets in 270 win. I suspect they will, and that will be kind of exciting. So that's why you can't get the, the heavier bullet in the TTSX. But let me tell you this, you really don't need it because those copper bullets like the Barnes retain so much of their mass that they achieve what we've been trying to achieve by building these controlled expansion lead core bullets for all these years to try to retain more of the lead and penetrate deeper because we've maintained the mass of the projectile. And as it moves through the animal, it's got enough momentum in that mass to penetrate deeply. That's why bullets like, say, the Swift A-frame, which is a, a bonded and has an extra, extra thick jacket, plus it's got a wall material like a partition bullet from Nosler across the middle of it. It is just beefy as heck. <laughs> and that thing will just keep penetrating because it generally retains 90% of its mass. The TTSX bullets I have had retain 100% most of the time. Unless they shear a pedal off, there's really no substance that's going to erode like lead would when it's pushing against tissue. So that's why a 130 grain TTSX bullet will penetrate as well as, if not better than, a 150 grain typical cup and core lead core bullet, or even some of the bonded bullets. Anytime you've got exposed lead friction against the tissue, especially muscle, hide, hair, there's a lot of drag there and it just kind of like sandpaper and it wears that lead away and you end up, you'll find your bullet looks like a, a perfect intact mushroom bullet, but you weigh it and instead of weighing 130 grains, it's only 110 or 120 or maybe even 100 because you've lost a lot of that mass. So don't get too freaked out. You can shoot your 130 grain bullet in a Barnes TTSX and expect the kind of penetration you would get from a 150 grain bullet. Steven has a question number two. For hunting elk and whitetail within 400 yards, would you prefer the 280 Ackley Improved or the 68 Western? Ooh, the 6.8 Western. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not a hand loader yet. I'm waiting on more of your reloading videos to come out. The 280AI, oh, by the way, my, my hand loading videos, we've got several of them uh, on RSO TV. So if you're a patron, you can see those or you can go to ronspoomeroutdoors.com website and sign up for RSO TV. Uh, the 280AI seems great if you're a hand loader and the 6.8 is relatively new, but it has limited ammunition choices. I know this is a hard question, but what's your answer, Stephen? <laughs> yeah, 
Yeah, Stephen, you've got a couple of good ones here, and they're just about peas in a pod as far as downrange ballistic performance. It's a tough decision. They both throw similar weight bullets. Obviously, one's a 27, one's a 28. Um, and yeah, gosh, you've got, I think the 280 AI is optimized with a 162 to 168 grain bullet. But you can go up to the 175s, even the 180s, and maybe even a 190. So you've got a little bit of an advantage with the heavier bullets in the 280 AI if you ever want to go there. But boy, the 6.8 Western with the 160 grain, 165 grain, um, 175 grain Sierra, you, you're right up there into that same wheelhouse with the 7s. Uh, so the difference is be a slight BC advantage to the 27s. If you got a 170 grain bullet in a 27 caliber and one in the seven millimeter, the 28 caliber, you're going to have a little bit higher ballistics coefficient in the narrower bullet, less drag. So there's a little bit of advantage there. And then the velocities, boy, you're going to get maybe 100 feet per second faster with the same bullet out of the 280 Ackley improved. But uh, downrange because of that higher BC in the 277, that's why I say they're kind of peas in a pod. So maybe your decision comes down to, do you want a standard length action, 280 AI, or the short action, 6.8 Western? And I would say, yes, you're probably right. You're going to want a hand load for both of those to optimize them and find your ammunition. These days, it's tough to find ammunition for anything but a 308 Winchester. It's just, it's crazy how they can't keep up with uh, manufacturing ammunition these days. I hope they, they manage to pull out of it, but boy, it's still you know, some shortages yet. All right, those are good questions. Now, this is Sean from Florida, and he has questions about cartridges. Ron, can you give me your thoughts on why the Remington 350 Magnum never really took off? They tried twice, I think. Long story short, my dad gave me his 1960s rifle. Absolutely mint condition. As you well know, I must hand load it these days. However, I've taken many deer and hogs with this rifle here in Florida, and none of these animals took a step. <laughs> you like that? I'm using a Barnes TSX 200 grain. Anyway, I love my 350 mag, and I'm looking forward to hearing from you. Thanks, Sean. <laughs> That's a, an oldie but not so goody. <laughs> and you're absolutely right. It didn't last for, I don't know, three or four years and it was already kind of out of the picture. Remington just sort of gave up on it. Now, why was that? I think it was a good idea. It's a, a belted magnum case, the same one as the 300 H&H magnum would use. They shortened it so it would fit in a short action. So it was sort of one of the first short fat cartridges that became the rage. But it didn't do well in the 1960s when it came out. And the biggest reason, I think, was the rifles it was chambered in were too short and light. The idea was to have a handy, quick brush rifle for elk hunting in heavy timber with some mass to that bullet. So the 35 caliber, yeah, people had good luck with the 35 Whalen, but that was on a 30.6 length action. Remington wanted to make this quick, handy little short action rifle they called the Model 600. The Mohawk, I think they called it. And it was a real crazy racy looking thing with a shark tooth front sight on it and a dog leg handle and things that really made it stand out visually. And it certainly attracted attention that way. And it was a nicely balanced, handy little rifle. But at the weight it came in at with 200 grain bullets that they were selling in their loads for it, ouch, a little bit hard on the shoulder. So a lot of guys didn't like it for the recoil. And the muzzle blast was pretty bad too. We didn't think too much about muzzle blast in those days. We didn't protect our ears all that well, which is why so many of us older gentlemen are a little bit hard of hearing. <laughs> so I think those are the reasons why it didn't do all that well. Plus, a lot of guys are thinking if I'm going out west to hunt elk, I might need to make a long shot. You I mean, it's one thing if you're hunting in the Pacific Northwest. You live there and you know how thick those forests are and you realize I'm never going to see anything further away than 100 yards. So what do I need long reach for? Whereas if you're planning to hunt the drier parts of the Rocky Mountain elk country and maybe throw a uh, mule deer in there, why not get a 300 Magnum? You got more reach, flatter trajectory, less recoil, et cetera, et cetera. So I think that's probably why. They did try to resurrect it. Gosh, was it in the, the early 2000s, I think? They came out with a, a new model rifle that was sort of a, a reflection of that old 600 Mohawk. And a, a 660 was another one they attempted in the 60s. Um, and that didn't work for them either. It was a little bit, I think they put a 20-inch barrel on that one instead of the 18-inch uh, barrel. 
So they tried, but once again, it just it never really took off. And the crazy thing is I was, I remember looking in a spear reloading manual and I was doing something on 35s a while back and the spear manual had the velocity at 2,700 feet per second. I wondered why so low? Cause that thing ought to be pushing more like 2,900 feet per second. Yeah. And they had the Whalen, the 35 Whalen doing 2,900 feet per second with a 200 grain bullet or 180 grain bullet, but not the 350. So um, I scratched my head and maybe it was a shorter barrel, but they were claiming that they tested it in a 24 inch barrel. Why was it so, so slow? Well, I think what they were doing was they were matching the original factory load from Remington. It was a 200 grain bullet going 2,710 feet per second or something like that. Now, why Remington did that again, I don't know. Were they thinking maybe there's too much recoil, so let's throttle it back a little bit? Because inside of 200 yards, it'll probably have more than enough punch with that big heavy bullet. The elk hunters won't even care. I don't know. But regardless, the whole thing just sort of fell flat. So if you have one, as you've discovered, you're going to have to hand load. But I think a, a good hand loader can develop some pretty effective loads for that thing. And if you don't mind the recoil, go for it. For a while there, I remember back in the 90s, there were getting to be pretty good prices on used Model 600s in 350 for elk hunters specifically working thick cover. So it does have a fan club out there. All right. Um, from Tennessee, it's Michael. He's asking about firearms, cartridges, bullets, hunting. Let's just see what he has to say. Ron, I love the podcast. Well, thank you, Michael. Appreciate that. Great exercise of the mind. Keep them coming. All right. I'll do that for you. I recently started shooting a 243 for deer hunting, and wow, do I like the six millimeters. <laughs> I'm with you there, Michael. I've also begun reloading my brass after the ammo shortage restricted my selection of what I shoot. I had a Remington with a nine and a 9.125 inch twist. Boy, that's narrowing it down. Uh, and I shoot the typical Winchester 100 grain power point ammunition. This firearm loves it. Half inch, no problem. 0.5 MOA. That's pretty spectacular stuff. During the storage, I swapped to Federal Power Shock, thinking that it would be similar. Two minutes of an angle at best. In either case, I reload with Hornady 100 grain interlock, pushing 3,000 feet per second. And no matter what I do, it seems two minutes of angle is the best I can get. The Federal and Hornady have boat tails, and I know that the Hornady is a secant ogive bullet, but I'm not sure about the Federal. Winchester, on the other hand, is a Spitzer with no boat tail. Am I maxing out bullet length with this secant ogive, or is there something else I can do to improve accuracy? I've heard that the secant can be troublesome without experience. By the way, I hunt inside of 400 yards. Oh yeah, this is a bit of a puzzle now. Easy answer, Michael, is that most rifles and barrels are a little bit picky about what bullets they like. I don't know if it's so much the bullet as the particular factory load. Uh, what you're doing is creating oscillations or vibrations in that barrel. And there are nodes of these oscillations. And if the barrel is kind of settled into the valley of a vibration and your bullet exits, it's pretty consistent and you get pretty good accuracy. If the barrel is in the middle of a whip back and up and down or something and the bullet gets thrown off, or if there's inconsistent powder densities in there and uh, that changes that node at which the bullet exits, that can affect the accuracy. The bullet itself, from brand to brand, you might be a little bit unbalanced or your rifle just doesn't like them for some reason we can't even nail down. So most of us, when we're working with rifles, end up trying different loads like you're doing and then picking the one that shoots the best or is the best combination of the kind of bullet we need for our work and accurate is good enough. Um, I mean, a two minute of angle rifle doesn't sound like much, but I wouldn't hesitate to go hunting out to probably even 600 yards with it because two times three, you're looking at a six inch group if you do your job. And you'll easily hit a deer with that. But I know what you're saying. I, I won't, pretty much won't be caught dead with a two MOA rifle myself. <laughs> so, yeah, I, the best I can tell you is to just keep playing around with it. Uh, you might try a, a weight on your barrel uh, to tame the nodes and the vibrations down. Remember the boss system that Browning had out for a while? 
I don't know if they still offer it, but there were other options like that in the aftermarkets where you kind of put a weight on the end of your barrel and you can adjust that to improve the accuracy. That works pretty well. And there was one out by Limb Saber. It was a rubberized thing and a little collet. You slipped over the barrel and you would move it up and down the barrel as you took sample shots to see which group the best. Kind of goofy looking having it hang on there. But tell you what, when you go from two minutes of angle to a half minute of angle with that clunky looking slow rubber on there, it starts to look pretty good. <laughs> so that is something you can try too. Um, I would say you can start to look at bedding and different things, but the fact that you're getting half ammo away with one factory load suggests that your barrel and rifle setup are plenty good, plenty accurate. So I think it is a, an ammunition question. You could also get someone to hand load and tailor loads for you. That often does the trick. You, you play around with your loads and you find out just the perfect combination. Now, this, the secant ogive on your bullet, I don't think that's a huge issue. The boat tail might be. And here's why. If you've got any kind of an imperfection at the very end of the uh, muzzle, the crown, right where the bullet exits, if it's a little bit flat on one side or it has a little divot out of the rifling or something, with a uh, the cone shape of the boat tail does not match up precisely with the cone shape of the, the muzzle exit crown there. Gases can jet out a little faster on one side or the other and destabilize the bullet right at launch. And that's why crowning tools are sold. I got one from Brownells years ago for a rifle that I thought was doing that. And you just hone that to a perfect circle, take out any flat spots or divots and bingo, your accuracy comes back. So you might want to look into that too. All right. Good, good, good questions there, Michael. I hope you get that problem solved. Aubrey from Georgia. I have problem finding the perfect all-round cartridge. Imagine that. No one's ever tried to do that before. <laughs> the perfect all-around cartridge. Man, do we cover that a lot. Yeah, that's a pretty common uh, pursuit. So you have trouble finding it. Oh, you want to cover moose down to whitetail. Oh, and you want to go to Africa too. Well, And you'd like something to take down dangerous game. Oh, my goodness. What would that bullet be? Whoa. Well, what would the cartridge be, I think, is what you mean, Aubrey. But you probably mean both. All right. So you're looking for the all-around cartridge for everything. Cape Buffalo on down to pronghorns, let's say. Obviously, you're making compromises all over the place here. You're not going to have the best pronghorn bullet in the world or cartridge in the world because it's not going to shoot fast and flat enough for long range work. But if you go with a fast, long range kind of cartridge, you're not going to have the bullet mass you want for the big Cape Buffalo. So the compromise is going to be, ta -da 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 -da, everybody knows this one, right? 375 H&H &H Magnum or the 375 Ruger, which is really pretty nice. It's a 30 at six length that performs like the full Magnum length, 30. 375 H and H. It's even a little bit faster because it's allowed higher chamber pressures. But at any rate, why the 375 H and H? That one has been standardized in Africa as the sort of minimum for Buffalo. And in some jurisdictions, you cannot use anything smaller or lighter. The 9.3 by 66, an old German cartridge is beloved, a little bit lighter than the 375 H and H. And that is grandfathered in in some countries because it is so effective. But generally, if you're going to be hunting the world and we want to find ammo and easily and all, 375 H&H &H is like the 30-06 of the world. 30-06 uh, is a great option for your anything up to moose size. But once you get into the dangerous game, you're probably not going to be allowed to use it. So 375 H&H &H can shoot up to 300 grain bullets or down into 250s to 230s, I think. It's a fairly light bullet. It's 250s for sure. So if you're shooting a 250 to 270 grain bullet out of a 375 H and H, you're going to have about the same ballistics performance, your trajectory curve, as a 30 out six shooting 180 grain bullet. And that has proven pretty effective out to 130 even or to 300 and even 400 yards, which is pretty much covering 99% of uh, what a hunter needs it to do. Uh, you can generally get a lot closer to that than that to most of your games. So, hey, 
And the recoil on the 375 H&H, while stout, is not brutal. Most hunters can learn to shoot it. I know a lot of small framed hunters have no problem with it. A lot of women who shoot it very well, including my relatively short, small wife. And she's taken buffalo and all kinds of stuff. So I think uh, 375 would be what I would suggest to you. And if you want a modern version of it, that check out that 375 Ruger. Um, you get in a little bit lighter weight rifle if you want to go there. All right. Now we're getting down the line here to Stewart in Canada. Ron, thanks for all your education. Um, uh, I got I got a question for you, which might have an interesting answer. Well, then again, maybe not. <laughs> we're going to find out here. Why does the 22 Winchester Magnum re regularly come in full metal jacket bullets? But to my knowledge, the 22 long rifle never does. Ah, good question. Basically, the answer is the 22 uh, long rifle is a solid bullet. It's just a chunk of lead. Sometimes it has a copper wash on the outside of it, but it doesn't really have a jacket. It doesn't need it because its velocity is so low. The reason bullets became jacketed instead of just lead was because the lead got going too fast with smokeless powder. And then it increased the friction and the heat and it melted the lead and the accuracy went south. And you let it up your barrels too. So they said, we've got to fix this problem. So they put gas checks on it. And eventually they got the idea of having a gilding metal jacket around that bullet. Um, and that's why. Now the 22 Winchester Magnum cartridge just happens to shoot fast enough to need that. Generally, you're looking at a 40 grain bullet at 1,910 feet per second. That's what most of the factories will advertise their speed. So there you goes your letting problem and your inaccuracy. So you have to put the jacket around the 22 Magnum. That's just that simple. And the final question is from Mark from Maine. I've been looking for 17 WSM, that's Winchester Super Magnum, rimfire ammunition for two years and I can't find it. Can you ask around your contacts and find out why? Well, I don't obviously have a chance right now to ask my contacts, but I would imagine because of the same reason you can't find most other ammunition right now, other than a 223 and a 9mm and a 308. Yeah, but they're starting to come back. I mean, I'm looking at the shelves in the local retail stores and starting to see a pretty good selection. But the 17 WSM has never been that popular. I wish it were because it's a heck of a cartridge. I think it's it's kind of the optimum for a rim fire. It's the hardest hitting, flattest shooting, least deflection in the wind, and everything else. It's a great little round. But until a lot of people start buying it, you are not going to find a lot of ammunition for it. I think there's only two brands that make it, Browning and Winchester. So I think you're going to have to wait until they get caught up with all the the common rounds, the 270s and the 30 out sixes and the different seven millimeters and everything else before they start making it again. Um, I'm sure there's a huge demand for 22s and and there are more 22 Magnums out there than there are 17 Magnums. So I, I that's my take on it. I can call around if you want to ask again in a couple of weeks, maybe I can find some absolute answers for you, but I'll bet you that's going to be it. And those are the questions for the day. We went kind of long. I appreciate your patience, everyone. Let me know if uh, you're enjoying these podcasts and if I can improve them in any way. We always appreciate hearing from everybody. Yeah, the idea is to share information, things that we've learned over the years, answer your questions, obviously, and get educated by you when we don't quite know the right answer. And I like to pretend I'm a know-it-all sometimes, but I know I'm not. <laughs> But I think with your help, I can get a little bit smarter and I'm happy to share anything and everything that I learn. So thanks for signing up um, at Patreon. We really appreciate all, all the help we get from our patrons. And until next time, I'm urging everyone to hunt honest and shoot straight. Mm -hmm.